leadership and organization development it is a pleasure for me to welcome you all my name is piyush and i am reminded of the quote the hardest arithmetic to master is that which enables us to count our blessings with greater and greater contribution of women in all things leadership i wonder where the world would have been if we did not have the active participation support and collaboration of women women leaders rock we are privileged to have with us today for the powerful panel women leaders as catalysts for an equitable world three eminent women leaders from social economic and public policy and governance domains they are anuaga malika sarabhai and chandra ayangar and in conversation with them today are our star professors from iim ahmedabad professor asha call and professor vishal gupta over to you vishal hello and welcome everybody uh, thank you piyush for the introduction uh, i would just take a minute and then we'll uh, move forward with the agenda just like to introduce to all the panelists as well as the participants and the audience about the ashang desai center for leadership and organization development the center was started this year uh, we inaugurated the center in in june and the aim of the center is to initiate conversations with individuals eminent personalities faculty students and professionals practitioners policy makers who's who actually around the world to actually think about how leadership can be strengthened what is the leadership dialogue that should be initiated in a country like ours what are some of the things that need to be done to strengthen leadership at the grassroots at various uh, different walks in life walks of life be it economic political social and others as a part of the center we would be organizing different events and one of the main uh, event is the panel discussion where we would take opportunity to talk about focused themes and and topics i'm very happy to announce that this is the first panel discussion that we are having and the topic could be i think not a more suitable topic could be thought of and that is women leaders as catalysts for an equitable world so we welcome on behalf of the center as the chairperson of the center i welcome all of you once again thank you to the panelists for taking out time and being with us to get into a conversation and talk about their life journeys i will now ask professor call to introduce to the audience our speakers for the day our panelists for the day so vishal as usual he's given me the tough task and the tough task is to introduce the three panelists why do i say it's a tough task one of the three panelists is living change one is the face of change and the third is implemented change how do i really begin with the introductions i think the safest way is to go ahead in the alphabetical manner so we have this anuaga who retired at the Therm as thermax chairperson in 2004 and from the thermax board in 2018 she is focused on social causes and is closely associated with the thermax foundation She is keenly involved with NGOs Akanksha and Teach for India, which promote education for the underprivileged. She writes extensively and gives talks about corporate governance, corporate social responsibility, role of women, education, and secularism. Draupadi, Malika Sarabhai, uh, she has been one of the uh, one of India's leading choreographers and dancers for over four decades. Uh, in constant demand as a soloist at her own dance company Darpana she has been creating and performing both classical and contemporary works over the last 18 ma months she has motivated hundreds of people through her many webinars and interviews and through Darpan's project Nritya Parichay to bring mental health and self esteem to thousands of marginalized youngsters Chandra Iyengar Uh, she holds a degree in MA from Miranda House, New Delhi, and is an officer of the 1973 batch of the IAS. Over the course of her career, she has had several. She has held several departments in the government of Maharashtra and the government of India, such as women and child development, higher and technical education, rural development, and health. She has been the secretary for women and child development for the government of Maharashtra, 
and she has been responsible for drafting and implementing the first ever state policy for women's empowerment in India. On that note, I think we need to begin. My first question, anyone can take up that question. Vishal, you can also take it up, Yush, anyone. So my question is, do you think women have acted as catalysts for an equitable world? If yes, how? If not, why not? Anyone can take up the question. You better point the questions at one of us <laughs> if you want us for one of us to start. We're all polite people. Malika, you can begin. Since you asked you want me? that question, you can be the first person to get started on that. I yes. repeat the question. Do you think women have acted as catalysts for an equitable world? If yes, how? If not, why not? Yes, I think. Um, I think women are catalysts for most things, uh, whether it is an accepted fact or not. Women for hundreds of thousands of years have been catalysts for the so for society. And, uh, you know, I, as a woman in a leadership position, I don't consciously think in terms of a woman leader. I, if I'm leading an organization, I lead an organization. But I have some instincts uh, that come out and I think those are nurturing instincts. I think however family-less a woman wishes to be, there is a nurturing instinct that today is desperately needed in this very, very fractured, very hate-filled, very frightened world. And the faster that it is seen that women are catalysts for a kinder world, for a more equitable world for for a juster and saner world i think the faster we will make progress towards getting there so yes women are and must be catalysts thank you so much chandra can i throw the question at you please the same question hey, okay i agree with uh, malika that women are not women are catalysts wherever they go even if they don't go anywhere but I think that precisely this is the point that the reason we need women in leadership positions and not just in leadership positions, we also need women in every level of growth development, uh, society, politics, economics, and so on, is because of the fact that we have some instincts, some a, a particular kind of reactions, a particular kind of approach, which is different from men in the same position. And I think that, that those are, they're not only different, they are things that actually push development. They push positivity. And um, as she said, these are what we really need in framing policy and implementing policy in this, in this, in the world that we find ourselves now. Thank you, Chandra. I know. I yeah. request you to posit your views. Yeah. Uh, I usually don't like dividing in men and women as having distinct qualities. I think there are softer qualities in men, uh, but by and large, because women have not entered the working world in large numbers, they have kept their softness, their intuitiveness, <coughs> and have a softer healing touch. And if you see in Ahmedabad itself, Malika and Ila Bhatt have done wonders in the social sector. Malika for social justice, for inclusiveness, for secularity, many causes. And Ila Bhatt has done so much for the women. If you see in the educational world, Shaheen Mystery started Akanksha and then Teach for India, which is bringing quality education for the underprivileged. And without education, no country can go any further. Thank you, Anu. So I think I'd also like to throw the question at the two men who are here sitting with us. Because you know, while we're talking about it from our perspective, Vishal, I'd like to hear your quick response on this question so that we can get moving to the next question. 
Well, I, I, I would, I would kind of agree with uh, Anu, Malika, and Chandra that women have an important role to play in the society. Uh, but when I, as, as a person from the other gender, I, I do think, uh, and I do feel that there are, there are lots of uh, obstacles and roadblocks that, that women have to experience. And, and it is to their credit, actually, that they, they are playing on a very uh, non-level, uh, uneven, <laughs> uneven playing field, but still they are trying to make the mark. And, and I think that's the, the panelists that we have. I think there is so much to learn from women who have shown that grit, shown that resilience in their lives to actually rise up and uh, even do what they've done on an uneven playing field. So. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vishal, for your response. So I give you the opportunity to ask us the second question, please. So I would, I, I would just uh, like to ask each one of uh, you, may, maybe we can start with Anu and then Chandra and Malika. What is the change that you represent? What is the kind of change we, we've talked about catalyst, but what is the kind of change that you've tried to live in your lives? And the associated question we'll take up, which is talking about how did it happen, but the kind of change you want to represent for our world, for this mm -hmm. society. Uh, in my generation, uh, the change was that a woman could head an engineering company, turn it around, and make it successful. And having said that, I could not have ever done it without the co cooperation of many executives, my family, destiny on my side. So I'm not taking credit, but symbolically at that time when I entered, not many were head of engineering companies. So that was a change I brought about. Uh, I think in my family and among friends, I symbolize courage to speak up when necessary against social injustice or when the Gujarat riots took place in 2002. So have the courage to speak up when necessary. Uh, I also think I represent a strength to take tough decisions, which people associate with men only. But in my journey, I've taken very tough decisions in our company and in the NGOs I've worked with. Uh, I've had to face two deaths of my husband and my son when I was 54 and get on with life and not get stuck. So uh, how to deal with that is an important, it is going to happen to all of us death. So how to deal with it? And I've written extensively on death and it has healed a lot of people who have read it. So I'll go. Thank you. Very, very, very informative. Chandra? Um, I'm not sure I really know the answer to that question. But I think in the kind of um, service that I belong to and the kind of jobs that were expected of me, um, you, you strive and you have to strive. I'm not the only one. I mean, all my women colleagues, others with me, you not just have to strive for equality, which you do have to strive for. You also have to strive for recognition, for uh, being taken seriously, and uh, this is not, you see, once you are in a particular position of power, like you know, I became, say, it was a later part of my career, then it's simpler because the chair gives you the right to change things. The chair gives you the right to, um, you know, give directions, whatever. But the challenge come, came in the middle years when I was in my 30s and my 40s, when you could be the only woman in a room and, uh, you know, you're really struggling with yourself to know whether you will be laughed at whether the point you're making is actually relevant or you're the only idiot who thinks that. And then you get the have to, you know, get the courage and you start 
voicing your side and, and then slowly looking at you, others do. And you encourage other women, whether it is in your own um, Biradari, the IS, or women who are in, say, the, um, who are attempting uh, leadership in political arenas, like the rural women, the panchayats, the gram panchayats, to trust themselves. And I believe that both between the women's policy and the rural development department I worked in in 2000, that's been my aim that to, that to, that to ensure that women believe that they have as much validity, as much right, have as much, uh, you know, I mean, they have um, to have the faith in themselves and to make sure that the others also start start believing in them and trusting them. That's a, that's a long haul, but it has to start with women, the woman herself. And I think that's where uh, the job, circumstances, whatever it was, my own approach to things did help. And I think I would, if I would be asked as to what would, uh, what is the one thing that you think you left behind? I would say, I hope I left behind the desire for empowerment, the desire to understand power and the desire to use power for social good or the good of the community amongst as many women as possible. Thank you, Malika. I'm going to start with an example of what I faced that made me realize a lot of things early on. I was in the IIM in the ninth batch, 72 to 74. It was the first batch that had more than three women. We were nine women, six of them from my Xavier's College in Ahmedabad, believe that or not. And uh, on the first day, uh, the professor of economics uh, asked all economic students to stand up and said to the class that they think they know economics, they know less than you. So just don't take them seriously. Uh, 85, 95% were engineers. Uh, we were all arts degree holders. And we got divided up into project groups. And there was one group, one girl in each group. And uh, in the first round of project work, I was told to go and Xerox stuff. Um, yes, those are the days of Xeroxing or cyclo styling, actually, not even Xeroxing. So I went, and then I was asked to organize coffee for everybody. And it was obviously <laughs> that I was being treated in a secretarial position which was fine, I did it. The next session, I was again asked to do the same and I said, I've done my bit, you go. And the boys sort of looked at me and then they looked at each other as if to say, she must be joking, right? And I looked unflinchingly at them and continued doing the work and whatever. And soon that got established that I will not take nonsense. Two of the girls out of the nine followed what I had done and got the same kind of level playing field. The others didn't. They continued being in secretarial positions, though they were very, very bright and as capable as anyone else. And I think that what I try and tell both women and men, but certainly women, is that being strong and being vulnerable are not opposite poles. Draupadi says a very beautiful thing to her husband when they are exiled. And she says something to the tune of, I have a brain and a womb and I use them both. And that's the point that we don't need to be aggressive and know it all. We should be so confident in ourselves that we can say, I don't understand. And we can say, I know I'm right. And I have also tried to show in the many talks I give, in the teaching that I do, that vulnerability is a strength, it's not a weakness. That for me to share my life with you, if I'm trying to motivate you, means I show my warts and I show how I got over them. I think that's very important not to say that I never had pain, not to say that I don't have a broken marriage, but to actually go through it and, and then talk about how the support system worked or who helped. And as, as Anu said, the support 
support system is very, very necessary because this society gives so much guilt to women about neglecting the family, neglecting the husband, neglecting your duties as a wife, that it's like a layer that you have to crush through before you can get anything done. Because guilt is not a factor that allows us to blossom. And I think the, the courage to first look into ourselves to find out whose script we are living and whether we are living our own script at all, and then to have the courage to talk about it. Uh, whatever the position, this can be a work position, it can be a personal position, it can be a leadership crisis, it doesn't matter. But to be able to have the strength to be vulnerable and then to be able to talk about it. And it's not about being a private person or a non-private person. It's, 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 just, it's just the way things need to be. And men perhaps are even less courageous because they have this, be a man. They've been strung on to the <laughs> necks from when they were in their chandis. And uh, nothing could be more disempowering. Men don't recognize it. We do recognize it. I think this is the great difference. So I talk to men equally saying, you know, whose lives are you living? Are you living the lives of your community, of your parents, of your frustrated parents who put their dreams on you and so on and so forth. But I think this acceptance that I don't want to wear the pants of the family. I couldn't think of a more boring option because I get to do it all because I am a woman. And I genuinely believe this, that I can do everything and be a woman and be a woman because I am a woman. And I think this is what I try and transmit. Do you Beautiful. mind if I just add something to what Malika yeah, said? Please. Malika talked about vulnerability. I think one of the reasons I succeeded is I was forever saying, I don't know, please help me to my executives. I'm not an engineer, I'm terrible at finance and to head an engineering company with complexity, if I pretended the company would have sunk. But I've always said, I don't know, to explain to me. And sometimes you take the decision because I'm not capable of doing it. When we were not doing well and made a loss one year, I wanted to bring a consulting company and all my executive, male executives in one voice said, no, we are capable of turning this company around and we can't spend crores on a consulting company. As Malika said, the macho image doesn't allow them to take help. But I think without the ability to say, I don't know and I need help, I don't think anyone can succeed. And if you do, it would be a tremendous stress to us. Personal, personal, personal stress. I mean, why? Nobody on this earth knows all the answers to show your vulnerability. There were times when where there were programs and I missed my husband and I cried, which none of the men had ever done. And I don't think that's my weakness. Exactly. I consider that as my strength to show my anger, my tears, my strength, and be a woman, be a total person, not just take some parts of the emotion and give it to men and some to women. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Chandra, I'd like to float the next question at you. So you have been the architect of a policy which empowers women. So we'd like to hear a little about the policy and we'd like to hear something about, you know, what are the challenges you faced at the time when you were drafting the policy? What were the thoughts that came to your mind and towards the end? You know, when the policy did see the light of the day, were there any challenges you faced while implementing it? So over to you, Chandra, please. Okay, I mean, um, we tried to make it an inclusive policy. So we held a series of meetings with NGOs, with people, with women in different sectors. I mean, let me be very, very honest about this. We did not make this an equal opportunity. Uh, opportunity. We did not say, okay, we're going to have equal num number of men and women because it was a policy for women. So we found women economists, women lawyers, women in the media, women in various things. And we said, you tell us in your sector what you think needs to be done by the state. Because the important thing that policy was that it was that the state with its with its enormous power, 
was standing and officially saying we are standing behind women. Not just saying we're standing behind women, we're saying we are standing behind it in this, 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 this way. I mean, we are reserving, uh, we are reserving uh, electro seats. We're like, uh, reserving jobs. We are trying to get you. Um, uh, we're trying to get you training. I mean, it's a forty-page document. Now, one of the things that kept at me, and everybody kept telling me, was, "No, no, you know, you you really have to focus on education and health." And that was the one thing that I, you know, I was not wildly wise at that age. This was around my forty. 40, early 40s and you know I, I was possibly uh, more pretentious more full of myself than very wise so but I was very clear about one thing that health and education were very 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 important but if a woman did not know how to either access it or use it though these were only tools in her journey and yes the state had to commit and we did commit to the tools which as you can see comes in the Sakshartha Mission, the NRHM all of which we have got but um, I very consciously put health and education as support structures, and I put freedom from fear, whether it was really? physical, economic, media, I mean, social. Freedom from fear was the one thing that the state needed to commit itself to. And that was sort of to say it in the current jargon, it was the hashtag of the, of the whole thing. Um, what were the challenges I faced? I mean, writing it was the simplest part because it just was a group of people. We got it through, we wrote it all that. It took me eight months from the, um, from, the from the time I you know, sort of signed on that final draft to actually getting the state government to agree. I mean, you know, in those days we had what is known as a cabinet meeting every week. So if you take eight into four, I went back and I went back and I went back and I learned so much about what every state in India had done for women by that time. And I think eventually they didn't give it to me because any of the cabinet believed in it. In those days, I don't even think we had a woman cabinet minister. They gave it to me because they were sick and tired of this policy coming again and again and again. And I remember the then finance minister, who was at Ms. Ramra, looking at the chief minister and saying, Sharad Rao, you're going to keep bringing this back. He said in Marathi, you're going to keep bringing this back until we clear this for you. So, you know, take it. So it was not this with the blessings of everybody. It was with a lot of um, unhappiness, not just from the politicians. I will, my main, main male colleagues didn't, I mean, when it came to property, for example, or when it came to, um, um, you know, power within the family or the idea of violence against women and the way women need to be treated in police stations and so on and so forth. Uh, we had a lot of, or, or the right of a woman over her child, abortion. These were the issues that um, struck a chord, I would say a negative chord across the spectrum. It was uh, men, the men in your social circles, your homes, I mean, um, your, you know, your official decisions. Because as I explained to my, uh, my chief minister, I said, look, many of us, I will say this about children, my children, and most of us, and I, I've been a single parent for, say, what, 30-something years. Um, most of us can go through life without really getting caught up in either a caste or a communal clash of uh, personalities or a power conflict. Gender is not like that. Gender is in your bed, so to speak. So every human being is affected by a policy for women, both the women and the men. And I think that is really, I mean, the churning that happened after that, uh, I mean, that luckily, as I said, because there was a state executive, you know, uh, it was an order, it was a policy and the subsequent acts followed. I am proud to say that what Maharashtra did in 1994-95, the government of India did in 2014-15, you know, the domestic violence, the, um, um, the right over patriarchal, uh, the, property, the right for uh, of the daughter in the matrimonial home, co personary rights, as we call it, stamp duties in courts. These came much, much later in the union government and other states. But yes, it, once the policy came forward and the women realized that the state was actually backing them. I mean, they weren't having to go to these, you know, you go to a police station and then the guy suddenly realizes that his, his entire government might ask him a question. Nothing changed overnight. 
I don't even know if they've changed uh, as much as one would love, like to see it 25 years now, after the policy. But yes, it gave it an it gave a certain kind of social impetus. It gave it churned a certain kind of mind. And I do believe that while husbands, the same man as a husband, got very riled at a lot of things. When he started seeing it as a father, I think he looked at it very differently. So you see the same man then sees both sides. And then I, I truly believe that that is how social change happens. And we're waiting for it to fully happen. But um, yeah, I think that, uh, and you can't, I genuinely believe that while social change is about society changing, unless there is a strong legal official backup for anyone which, uh, and vulnerable marginalized uh, portions of society mere social thoughts are not going to change it they must have authority they must have the power to enforce their rights and this has to be given and i think uh, the policy did that by saying yeah you have you have rights and the state is going to help you enforce it and i think that was basically it Thank you so much, Chandra. So if I can just ask Chandra a follow-up question on that. And, Please. Uh, so you, you very rightly mentioned that if you look at any social change, it has to have the backup or the backing of the state, the legal machinery, the, the political will that is needed. But uh, how, did, how did that realization for change actually come about that, well, we need to have a policy for women? Uh, how did... Maharashtra government well, at that point in time understand I, that as a... No, I tell you what, I mean, the first question is very simple. That the fact that something had to happen was something as a woman working, you know, by which by the time you're in your mid-career, you are a bit fed up with this whole situation and you realize that things that need to be done. And then mm. you sort of find yourself in a position where you believe that it is possible. I mean, if you're heading a department for women, you feel that this is something that can be done. And then you, of course, struggle and you manipulate and you strategize and you push and you pull and you, uh, you know, you sort of move this little elephant around the room and try and get it out. Uh, that's sort of, I suspect, uh, what happened eventually. Of course, I was very lucky in that in spite of all the uh, negativity that was there, there was, I, there was a certain amount of, I will not, political backing at a, at a very high level. And uh, I think the rest of them really didn't know how to say no, you know? I mean, they could not think of a valid reason to oppose it. They would have liked to, but yeah, as logical men, and I agree with, uh, with everyone when they say that men do have a positive side to them, most of them. When you put up something to them and they don't want it, but they have no way of telling you why they don't want it and there's no reason, they eventually give up, you know? Okay. So I, that's what really happened. So I have to okay. look for the positive side of the Vishal, okay, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, can I go ahead with the next yeah, question, please? please. please. Uh, Malika, in 1990 came that movie, Peter Brooks, Mahabharat, for which New York Times, you know, really uh, wrote very highly about you. So to be able to get into the role of Draupadi Malika, you would have spent, you know, many days trying to think who Draupadi is, trying to live that character, to be able to project it on screen. And you all got a lot of awards for that film. So Malika, what we wanted to understand from you was, you know, Draupadi, one of the characters who's there in Mahabharat, you know, she's supposed to be a very strong character. She's supposed to be a very strong character and she's been able to man five husbands, right? What do you think were the strengths and can those strengths be emulated in the current world, not of course with five husbands, but generally, uh, can those trends be learned where Draupadi is concerned? So that what we're trying to do is you're trying to extrapolate, you know, certain lessons from the life of Draupadi as you saw it, as you lived it while the film was being done, and what were the challenges she faced, which could probably be again extrapolated to the current world. May I also add something, Asha, if that's okay? Please, Chandra, please, please. I, I mean, um, Malika, you know, I saw this on stage. I don't remember the date and the year, but I remember. And I think the one, one of the things that I still carry with me, maybe a little faded now, but uh, I still carry with me, was the 
you know, when you come to the Vastraharan part, you know, what really came through from that performance was an enormous amount of vulnerability and courage all rolled into one at the same time. And I really, really, um, I mean, how did you get, is that something that you worked on? Is that something that you would naturally have? Because if something can stay with a person for so many years, it must have had this huge impact across the audience. Could I, have to, I have to say that, um, Asha, before the film, I had performed it across the world for five years, first in French for two years and then in, so it was a long period. It was a turning point in my life. I went in as a very acclaimed dancer and somebody who fought social battles separately, but never marrying the two. Uh, I was the only Indian on the car in the cast. I was the only person who had epitomized uh, in her in, in my dreams Draupadi as a woman. As a child of five, the only woman character that I wanted to be like was Draupadi, because I felt that the certainly the versions that were given to us, everybody else was a black and white character. You know, you were either good or you were bad. And a lot of my work subsequently has been in unraveling those characters and showing them in the true light that they are in. But Draupadi could never, ever be put into a box, which is why there are no temples. She was the only one of our heroines who was not made into a goddess. She was just too unconventional. To me, she was the epitome of the 21st century woman. And I'm glad Chandra saw that because I went through tremendous self-interrogation in that process of, 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 of trying to represent Draupadi. What I was talking about is vulnerability and strength and the ability to say that I don't know what to do in this situation and the ability to say that I'm not a pushover. The ability to say that I am as married to the truth as my five husbands, the ability to keep them ever from fighting with each other. That's the one of the instinctual abilities I was talking about in my first answer when I said that a woman has an instinct of bringing things together. And this, the Pandava's mother also saw, Kunti saw, because the, the, what she says is that Draupadi will be the palm that makes the fingers into a fist. So she is the one who will hold the family together even when married to each one of them individually. She was also Krishna's counterpart. So in, in other stories, she is Krishna's sister. She's also called Krishna with the two A's. And it was during this period that I started seeing the power of performance for social change. Because women as varied as young uh, girls studying in the Sorbonne type mini skirts, very hip, Two Aboriginal women in Perth, two black mamas in Harlem would come backstage and say to me, that's the kind of woman we believe in. The, my, one of my first encounters in Paris was when middle of the night, I was standing at a metro station after a performance and two girls from across the platform said to me, Madame Traupadi. And I was sort of learning French. I sort of looked around and, and they said, you know, we are not feminists, but uh, we believe you. We want to be like you. And it was an extraordinary revelation of how the interpretation of one character was touching so many women and so many women with completely different mindsets, backgrounds, and so on. And I think that is the strength of Draupadi. She was a strategist. She was proud of being a woman. She was a wife. She was somebody who held the family together all through great stress. She was somebody who stood up for truth and courage and didn't mind telling her senior husband that he was weak, that you might think you are the greatest truth sayer, but you are weak and your weakness will lead this family to ruin. So she was not afraid ever of saying the truth to, to, to power because her husband was the king. And I think these are all qualities that female leadership bring in very often and our qualities that we have spoken of here. So I think, uh, yeah, Draupadi is the right role model. So Malika, why is it that people don't like to name their girls Draupadi? I've yet to come across, you know, we've got almost uh, how many students that move out from the campus every year. 
So it would be thousand, more than thousand students. And I've still not come up with anyone, with a, any girl with the name of Draupadi. And when I do this session, LVMR with my students and I ask them, would you like to name your daughter Draupadi? I don't get a yes. Would you like to marry a girl with the name of Draupadi? I've never got a yes for an answer. Because we are so completely brainwashed. We are brainwashed by patriarchy. We are brainwashed by what our parents tell us. We are brainwashed into thinking that a woman like Draupadi who questions everything is too much to handle. I mean, I, I will tell you the other side as well. I have a show called Sita's Daughters that I've done, I don't know, hundreds of times across the world. Incidentally, when Sharadji was chief minister, um, Sita's Daughters was made compulsory viewing for all new magistrates. Do you remember? And I'm sure Chandra had something to do with that. <laughs> uh, it was a very, very, you know, it, it provoked thought. And yes. that was very necessary, you know, and because a lot of us come in with baggage wherever we are. And we need to first unload our own baggage. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and, and one, there's never an end to it. I do it every day. I yeah. ask myself constantly whether a particular move was showed any prejudice, any injustice, any lack of kindness and so on. But that is it. I, was, I was touring with Sita's daughters in America and I was at uh, Wisconsin University. And uh, my Sita in Sita's daughters is a Sita who looks back at her life and says, Rama, it's not the way you saw it and it's not the way it's told. Um, and she ends up saying that, Madhara, take me back because I took part in a weak man's test. How can that be my test? So it's, it's that kind of thing. And a yeah. girl came running backstage and said, oh, thank God, I have cursed my mother for calling me Sita for 20 years. Now I know why I should be called Sita. So there's the other side as well. Yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. So the next question, Khan? Yeah. So, uh, so we'll come to Anu. Uh, anu, you did mention as, as an individual, you've, you've seen loss in your life and uh, personal losses. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, if it is okay with you, what were the kind of things uh, as an individual, what was that capability or capacity that helped you overcome those, those difficult moments or difficult times that, and, and help you over the years in, in running an organization as large as is that what was the kind of uh, capacity that was exhibited, the, the experience of, of going through that, uh, those, those incidents? Uh, let me take a little time. My husband in his late 40s had a massive heart attack followed by a stroke. And that made us all realize that we don't know how much time he has. So I joined the company at that time in HR, just the background. And there was a sword hanging over him because he was a smoker, continued to be a workaholic. But we never anticipate death of our loved ones. We never. In fact, I was so paranoid that if ever the word death was stolen, I would make my husband stop the car, find a tree and go and touch it. And I know today, even if I carry the entire forest, I can't get away from there. So when he actually died, I was coming back from England. He had come to the Bombay airport to receive me. And before he came to the airport, he died at our guest house. So I got the news and I was stunned. We are never ready, as I said. And within the third day, the board said, you will be the chairperson. And I was not ready to assume this responsibility. I just felt I was not the right person to head this organization. As I said earlier, I don't know engineering. I don't know finance. I don't know anything about in HR. I knew my people very well, but not the operations. So I was battling with my self-doubt, my lack of faith in myself. For years, I had heard of Vipassana, the meditation Buddhist meditation program. In fact, my husband used to tease me that he'd love to see me quiet for 10 days. But I said, I want to go because I'd heard it's a tough program, but it has healed many people. So I went to Ahmednagar 
there are times when I felt like quitting, but I'm not a quitter once I decide on something. And while staying silent, not reading, writing, distracting yourself, for 10 days, you have to go inwards. And I realized that nothing is more certain in life than death. And yet, we don't even want to say death. We say demise. We try and use words which are not so straight about death. I felt that once you accept death of yourself and your loved ones, it frees you and it gives you, you ask yourself, if I'm here for a short time, what am I going to do that's meaningful for me and others? So you ask basic questions and you get inner, inner strength that you have been able to deal with the most difficult challenge and if you could get over that, what is thermites in a way? At, that was at one level. At another level, I felt very small. But that questioning came up. You know, I got strength that I can meet any challenge that I want to. And I can't tell you how it has helped me. I've been for four meditation programs. I do it every day for an hour. And it has definitely changed my attitude to life and to myself. So, so the, accept, the acceptance of, of the impermanence of our lives and, and the importance of asking what is the value, what is the value that we create for ourselves and for people, people around. But also, you realize that let's invest in people who I care for, not the whole world, deeply invest in people very often most people end up feeling very guilty or full of regrets when someone dare to them die i wish i told my mother i love you i've never told her. i wish i'd hugged her i realize whatever if ever some i would do it when i want to and when that person is alive and i'm sure everyone has a few regrets and a few uh, things but for me, I've lost many dear ones after my, the death of my husband and my son, but I have no regrets because I fulfilled what I wanted to in that relationship. So that's very important. Okay, thank you. We have a lot of questions. So do we want to go down to the questions or do we want to have to ask more questions? We can ask one. Okay, sure. So there's something very interesting that happened while we were talking to Chandra and uh, there was a little bit of dialogue and probably I'd like to, uh, you know, float this on the same question at uh, all three of you. I know this time we'd like to begin with you. So, you know, when you see the young girls and the women who got into organizations or who are on the threshold of getting into organizations, there are times when you take a look at them and you take a look at how they conduct themselves. You know, what are the first thoughts that come to your mind? Because these are the girls who are going to be catalysts for change. So do you think, according to you, you know, whether all girls are moving in the right direction or you think that there's a need to be coaching, counseling them? What, who, did, what, who did you ask this question to? I don't think Anu, we'd like to begin this time with you. Okay. Please. I would never put one gender into one thing that they are all the same. There are women, my, for example, take my case. My husband was softer than me in many ways. And you associate softness with a woman. In fact, in the company, they said, if there was anyone who could take tough decisions, it's only, you know, with compassion, with thoughtfulness, but taking tough decisions. So I wouldn't put all the women together as if they're all unionized together. No, each one is different, but I agree with you that mentoring, coaching, uh, support at a time when they feel vulnerable joining a male dominated organization like ours definitely helps a lot, definitely. And I remember Indira Parekh and I used to conduct programs for our women and help them to stop having, putting themselves down and having ambitions to go further in their career. 
So telephone operator finally end up, ended up in HR. So they definitely need that support. I do think so. But let me tell you, many men need it too. It's not sure. just the women. Let's not assume that everything is wonderful for men. So whoever needs uh, some mentor coaching, it does help. Thank you, Chandra. Um, okay, what is that uh, each generation brings with it its own problems. I mean, at one level, I look at the youngsters who are in government now and, uh, you know, they fair, face things which we never faced. But they are also provided with uh, the tools, the technology, the maturity at one level to deal with it. So it's not, it's like a river, you know, when we're constantly moving, my generation did it, moved and they moved better ahead with it. But I think some things are constant. And um, this is, even today, um, girls, women are a minority in most organizations. And I think um, it's, it's important. It's important to, when you, and when you say mentoring, I would, um, I'd strongly say that the mentoring has to be about, about them, about how they look at themselves, how they, um, as she said, you, you stop looking at yourself as somebody who is lesser than other people, which is, we, we all come in with a lot of baggage and every generation does it. It's just a different kind of baggage. And uh, to trust themselves, to understand that there is a struggle. I mean, you can't be nice and uh, alone. Yes, being nice is a very, very important part of um, any kind of growth. But you must, have, um, you must have the strength to stand up for what you believe in, to strive for authenticity. I would say that, uh, and this I said to uh, a lot of young bureaucrats uh, for when they used to come and see me, that there's no point in being a second-rate man. What you need to be is a first-rate woman. Because you see, when you we don't have role models. Uh, most, in most places, women are just about beginning to have role models, you know? Um, so what you do is you look at the men who are successful for what it's called, and then you don't check whether that's the direction you want to go. I mean, and it's you know, one of the things that I learned from somewhere was that success is a la is a wall okay so which wall you want to climb i mean success can be in many fields okay you have to choose which wall you want to climb on and that your ladder has to suit that wall I and mean, if it's a tall wall you you need a tall ladder so you have to understand that copying male attributes as uh, you know we talked about earlier aggression if it doesn't come naturally to you, that's not your mode of solving problems. You've got to find your own way. So I would say that if I were to say this, yes, mentoring is necessary. It's just that we need to look at what they need now rather than what I would say. I would like to look at what they need now rather than what I needed when I came in. You know, they're two completely different worlds. And so Thank I'm you so much. Malika. Well, if I can combine that question with just one more question before we are, Vishal takes the floor away from me. What's your signature statement? So while answering this question, you could also give me an answer. What would be your signature statement that would define you? I'm a little worried before Vishal takes the floor away from me. I said, let me just float that question together with the previous one that I had floated at you all. I interact a lot with young people because I'm constantly being asked to speak at universities and through this COVID period, um, many, many times more than when I actually had to say no to traveling. They are a generation under great stress, stress to get more likes, stress to get more bells ringing, stress to get more people following them. And when Chanda talked of authenticity. One needs courage to go inwards. That I think is what most people are frightened of. When you talk of success, it's the brand managers that 
are convincing us what success is. If you ride this car, you are a success. If you wear this brand, you are a success. To me, success is what makes me a happy and generous person. I don't, I don't, that is the only wall I want to climb. And I try and tell people that one's definition of success can be different at different times. So there might be a lot of parental pressure. We did this for you. We gave up this for you. Now you have to get a good house. You have to get a salary and so on and so forth. So there are those obligations. But today those obligations can be fulfilled and you can still have many years to go. I try and tell them that this matrix between family, expectations, self-fulfillment, job achievement, money, needs to be revisited every three or five years. I think the greatest unhappiness amongst people lies in the fact that they never readdress these. So I have colleagues from IIM who meet me and say, you're so fortunate you did exactly what you wanted to do when you wanted to do it. We didn't know when our kids grew up. We didn't know when they drifted apart and so on and so forth. But it doesn't have to be like that. If you introspect at a very early age to try and find out what that matrix is for you today, what it is in another few years, and you can say, stop the world. I want to get off. I want to do my own thing. That to me is success and that to me is courage. And I try and share this with young people, as Anu said, boys and girls both, because I feel both are trapped in their own expectation as seen from the perspective of society who you are currently emulating and that can never lead either to a better world or to or to more fulfilled people and my Super. mantra that is my mantra that's, that's your signature statement you're looking that, for that really your is mantra. mantra okay uh, so anu what would be your mantra or your signature statement uh, I would say I'm a seeker and yet peace with myself because I have defined success as setting my own goals and it can be as small as not overeating for a day, for that day and achieving it rather than fame, power, position and all the external rewards and awards. To me, those mean very little. They do tickle my ego for two minutes, but that happiness doesn't last. It's what I set out to do myself and achieve it. That's how I would say it's successful. Thank you, Chandra. What's your signature statement, Chandra? I, I think what I would like to say is that I would like to feel at every phase in my life, you know, there is, I think every 10 years, every, depending on the, whatever you, you face, you are entering a new phase in life. And if I can, I would like to say that in each, in each phase, I am me, I am authentic. I am, I have tried to be aware of myself, whether I've succeeded or not is a separate uh, you know, questionnaire, but that would be my, that try to, try to be yourself, try to be authentic. You know, there is a line, which I remember from school or somewhere that, I think it's Shakespeare. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day. Thou canst not be fa false to any man. And I believe that that is something that I've held on to. Thank you. Yeah. So let us take some questions. Uh, uh, Fiyush, would you start with the first one and then I'll go to the second? Or I can. You're take muted. The... You're muted. First and foremost, I have to say what an exciting discussion this has been. And uh, I guess everyone has their own ways of expression. And I believe we all have lots and lots of questions inside of us. But finding ways to say it is, I guess, more than half the battle. So this, I'm trying to decode this phenomena. We have had an unprecedented turnout and not a single question for the longest of time. And I was thinking what is going on and I guess it has been such a stupendously engaging session that in a kind of stillness, 
everyone was speechless but i'm happy that finally we got a barrage of questions and i guess at least four or five of them deserve to be asked in the time that we now have left so one of them is women hold 17% of board positions in corporate india but only 11% leadership roles your kind views and reviews anu i think you should go first no yeah. that would be too <laughs> stereotype you go first okay i'll go first okay uh, you know we talk of many changes in the external world but entering the corporate life has a, is a very slow change in my own company my daughter who's a chairperson and i are pushing our people to take more women but i don't know whether it's the biases or what comes in we end up having 6% of women in our company and as you say out of that there must be not even 1% at the top so there are many biases she will leave us when she gets pregnant as if men don't leave us for better salaries uh she will stop working uh she can't be kept late nonsense all utter nonsense the young trainee engineer girls are saying send us to sites send us expose us exactly. and we have our own mindset about what women want so i think a lot of work has to be done but i think some work women have to do within themselves also there are women especially i've seen this in G- in the ngo sector who after a few years say i'm going to drop out for a couple of years which man has the luxury to say that that i'll stop earning for a couple of years you know so we also have to take ourselves seriously before the world takes us seriously so i'll stop thank you very important yeah you know i think um, i believe that all of us women have a switch inside our heads and i have seen this with ceos of banks ceos who run big corporations but somewhere we need a pat on the back from a man it doesn't matter what man it can be a husband it can be a boss it can be a colleague and unless we turn off that switch this is not going to happen we need yes we need to work doubly hard to do this but yes we want our piece of the sky and we are going to have to work for it every single day with our husbands with our sons do we bring up our children to be just equal human beings or are we still bringing them up to be boy and girl hindu and muslim meat eater non meat eater and all these binaries we've got to change we've got to make the change i have brought up my two children as my own personal social experiment and i'm very happy to say whether they get on with me or not they are wonderful human beings who will not take any of these prejudicial binaries and i think that's where we need to change because we need to see ourselves as people not as women and men yes of course we are women and of course we are proud to be women but we've got to fight it another way and i'm sorry to use the vocabulary of war which i hate but there is a limitation on words we've got to battle it fight it you always come to the same words but you know what i mean i hope can i ask malika how do you know men don't want a pat on their back also i think they know but they're not al- they 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 do but they are not allowed to say it because that would be weakness so in they fact they know they actually need a hug they need a hug but they can't ask for it but don't do it at the workplace otherwise <laughs> sexual harassment please <laughs> yes that too uh, chandra your views chandra your views please um well i'm not really that you know apart from a couple of quotes now i'm not really competent to speak on the corporate sector but i i mean i don't think this is different anywhere with the percentage of women to in top management i mean look at it look at the union cabinets look at the state cabinets look at the um, chief head of the head of the bureaucracies there has to be a push from the bottom which means that there have to be i mean i agree with both uh, anu and with malika that women also 
must start. It's not enough to say, oh God, I'm not being treated equal. What are you doing that people should treat you equally? I mean, are you working hard enough? Are you using what talents you have towards a public good? I mean, if you are a, if you are a performing artist like Malika, are you using your talent to do something for people? Or are you just sitting there saying, nobody's apl applauding my efforts? Or if you come up the corporate ladder like Anu, are you being sensitive enough to see what is needed and help it? Are you, are you, you know, one thing that Anu said right at the beginning, which I think we should all sort of keep in mind is this, that we really don't know. I mean, uh, so I got into this uh, job with a competitive exam, uh, won it along with, a, you know, a limited number of, and all that was fine. But the point of the matter is I came from a very cocooned back to a background. And while my brains were equal, I wrote that exam, I got through. My social and emotional exposure to the world was just so unequal. Okay, I had to work on that. I had to develop that. And I think women, instead of, you know, we also need to, um, okay, let me, let me sort of get to say this as quickly as I can. Number one, we need to push. And we need to push saying, this is what we want. This is my right. I can do it. I have the caliber to do it and you jolly well give it to me. I mean, what is wrong with you that you don't give it to me? But at the same time, make yourself, and you know, work on yourself also that you, um, and make sure about one thing. And I say this from the beginning that it's, you cannot have sweet ways of getting anything. You have to ask for power. You have to ask for authority. You have to ask for responsibility. And these are things without which there can be no empowerment. I mean, it's a combination of the three. So I think, yes, we are having a bad time across and whoever asked that question, I completely agree with you that that's not a happy situation. But I think there's a little push and pull here. I think the youngsters of this generation should keep pushing and people like us who finished can, but perhaps can help in the pulling should keep pulling. And this is where we rope in our men colleagues with whom we've spent so many years working, saying, listen, boss, give us a hand now, even if you didn't do it earlier, and help these youngsters come up so that the next generation is, you know, less. Thank you. Let's have the next question. So, th so there is uh, a question. I think we've answered it in some parts, but uh, we can combine two of these. So a question is, uh, any particular word of advice for the women of this generation, which will help them to bring about a greater change as a catalyst for an equitable environment. So what is what would be your advice for women of this generation, not just women, I think people or, or younger. Michelle, what we can also do is, you know, like one question for each of the panelists yes. so that we can address more, more questions. questions. Yes. So yeah, so you could address it to any one of them. So you have to... Yeah, so Anu? Yeah. If you, would... uh, you know, I would focus always more on the change you bring within yourself because that's within your control. The external world is not in your direct control. So I would ask women to question the messages they have received from their parents and are they slaves to those messages or have they been aware and working and not fighting those, well, not battles. I don't want aggressiveness, but assertiveness. I make a difference. And I think women have to be assertive. I'm going to say something which might shock people, but to, it's important. In my time, virginity was such an important thing. I mean, a woman, good woman was defined whether she was a virgin or not. For men, it didn't matter. In fact, he, if he was, he was something to question. Is he all right? You know, these kind of deep down biases which society have given, it's up to a woman to fight it. It has nothing to do. You won't change the external world. They will call you a slut. They might call you all kinds of names. But do you have the confidence to take up battles which you want to. This may not be your battle. It may be the way you dress. For example, if a woman wears something, I remember in parliament, we discussed that a judge said that a woman deserved this rape because she wore provocative clothes. 
How dare a judge make a statement? I, as a woman, would never accept it. Never. A woman can walk naked down the street and nobody should touch her without her consent. That's the kind of woman I'd like our women to be and not be defined by society and their parents. Great, great answer. Let's move on to the next yeah. question. So. I think this one can be for Chandra. What do you feel is an under, underutilized policy intervention for a more equitable world? You mean a policy which is already there and which nobody is using? Or which the women are not taking advantage of? Yeah. Uh, I would say job reservations. Sorry? I would say job reservations. Job, job reservations. reservations. You're not trying for them. They're there. Any, you know, the, the, you look at the difference. Uh, panchayats, you're, everyone's warring with each other to get those women's reserve seats for whatever it is. But jobs, third, almost every state in this country has got about um, 30%, some whatever, up to about 30% jobs kept us at It's what is called as a horizontal reservation. But in terms of uh, figures and statistics, what that young lady, whoever asked the question right in the beginning, now, those are the percentages that we're looking across. I mean, look at parliament. You know, I would say, I'm not that being an MP is a job, as far I don't know if you call it or not. But um, the fact is, you have to, you really have to aim to get into positions where you are, to begin with, it's not about other people. This is about your own, unless you can provide yourself with bread, butter, and jam, you're never going to be as, as, empowered as free as you want to be okay so i think it, women must understand that economic empowerment is important and therefore a job is something that is a woman's right and it's also in her very great interest to be economically independent yep. and i think that this is a policy that needs to be pushed and it's not just jobs it could be training it could be skill up upgradation i mean you have a whole national uh, commission for skill development I'm not certain how many women are actually utilizing it and how much the commission is chasing women. Both this. So this, this would be for Malika. Uh, so the question is to have an equitable society, the male members should be free from gender bias and they need the courage to question their own unconscious social beliefs as a man. What can bring a sense of equality in the male members of a patriarchal society. Well, I always say that the easiest way is to bring up your own children differently. That's, that's the first thing. So if my children are brought up differently and that I have control over, you may not have control over your husband because he's been brought up differently, but I do <laughs> control how my children are brought up. And if my children are brought up differently, then in 30 years, we'll have a completely different generation. That's the fastest. The other is to actually have the courage when you are growing up, when, when you begin to ask these questions, is to actually talk to your male colleagues, talk to them and say, what is it? Why is it that you are bothered if somebody whistles at your sister, but you whistle at somebody else? Why? We don't have conversations about this. And it doesn't have to be aggression or a dispute. It's not all Republic TV, God forbid. It has to be a conversation. And I say to young girls, when they say, you know, we will be forced to be, be married at 22. And I say to them, start a conversation with your family at 16. Say, why is it that you have different rules for my brother and for me? And for sensitive brothers, I say to them, why don't you say, if my sister is not allowed to go out after 10 o'clock, I won't go. Individuals have to make that decision. I, for instance, I'm always chided because I never accept in a conversation a word that only defies men and includes women as part of that. So chairman is something I will pick up a panga about language every time, no matter where I am, because I think that the words define the mind. And unless you are aware of it, unless you change it. I mean, to women, I say, are you looking at the way you treat your maid? Are you treating her like another equal human being or are you treating her badly? These are all things that you can change from the house and from inside go out. 
rather than from the outside come in. But con don't always talk about what you have shopped or which film you have seen on Netflix. Talk about issues that can actually bring about change when you're having coffee with your friends, when you're having coffee with your women friends. How often do you talk about what can we do to influence this to make it a more equitable world? We don't talk. We think everything will happen automatically. Somebody will press a switch there, somebody will change a law here, and everything will be hunky-dory. How many of us have the courage, men especially, to say, I will not marry with a dowry? There are a million things you can do in your own life to make it more equitable. Do it. It's a full-time job. It's 24-7. But do it. If you want change, do it. I think all three of us have done it. And, and we are talking about it because I ask myself every day whether I have been incorrect with somebody, whether I said a word that was dismissive, whether I said a single thing that was gender insensitive. And I learn every day. But it's, it's, it is a full-time job. Making a more equitable world is a full-time job. Yep. Can I just mm -hmm. add something to this, if it's okay? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. All right. No, I just wanted to add a little bit, I mean, um, as an add-on to this question. Look, uh, men aren't going to do anything on their own. I mean, let's get one thing clear, that this is a power struggle. Men have had power. They've had it for, I don't know, millions of yeah. years. Okay? Nobody gives up power. I, unless it's a mother to the child or some such thing, you know, where you're doing it because, you know, anyway, you're in power, so it doesn't matter if you give a little. And I think we should not, we should not uh, wince about the fact that it is, I mean, as uh, Malika said, it doesn't have to be a nasty fight, it doesn't have to be aggressive, but let's understand, you, you are trying to get an entire group of people give up their power so that you can get some of it. This is a struggle. There's nothing wrong in having a struggle. What is wrong is in making it ugly. So I think let's get this. Let's understand that we are going in a struggle. We have to struggle. But let's do it with grace, with dignity, and with um, as much human humanity as we can. I mean, I think uh, the struggle part of it just cannot be. Uh, I don't think it's going anywhere. I mean, that's my opinion. Yeah. Can I also add something? Yes, please. Yes, please, please. Many women crib about men not helping at home. But during COVID, when men started cooking, doing jaru katka, many women felt very uncomfortable. How can he do this? He's my Raja and this kind of a nonsense. Oh God. <laughs> we say one thing, but our messages are taking us to another pair. So be aware of this dichotomy within us. Yep. Thank you. That's great. So, yeah. There are, yeah, Piyush. One book that you people would recommend that all women read, something that they may, that may enable a thought change. Oh, oh that lady from Nigeria, she, I, I she, know, she, she is excellent. The one who talks about different conversations. Yeah. She, Wonderful. She, Actually, she, yeah. Chinua uh, Yeah, she no. is. And she is. Chima Mande. Chima Mande. Chima Mande. Chinua. Chinua Mande is a male writer. Yeah, male writer for fabric. Sorry? Yeah, male writer. No, I was just correcting the name. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. yeah. Malika and Chandra, do you have a suggestion? Um, no, I don't think there's any one that I would suggest that would. You know, I think a lot of it is, uh, I think a lot of it is internal. And I also believe that we need to also look at our own cultures. We have a lot. If we say that in our own culture, if we just look around, you will find examples of people, women who stood their ground, did what they had to do, made names for themselves. We just need to also look at the local uh, ethos from which we all grew up. You know, many of us are a little um, uncertain about these things. You know, we were talking earlier about, you said about Draupadi. That's absolutely true. You won't find a Kaikiri either. Sure. And, but sure. if, you, if you come down south, for example, Ravan in Sri Lanka. A great guy. A completely different person in Sri Lanka. Or in Tamil Nadu for that matter. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I think you are, your question was about a book and my answer is that I, I don't believe in binaries. There can't be only one favorite yes. book. I have lots of favorite mm -hmm. books and it depends on my mood that day, it depends on what my needs are that day. Uh, and I try and read severally and voraciously. So can't answer that question. Yeah. So there's a, uh, maybe we can just take two questions. So this is a question, why a woman who sacrifices everything is most praised and most acceptable in the society even today? Can I, can I start with, can yeah, I start with yeah. that one? Please, yes, please. Kendra. All right, it's uh, look, number one, of course, more fool she. Exactly. The point is, what? Sorry, sorry. More fool she. Uh -huh. So, but the thing is, this is exactly what I think we've all been trying to say, that there is a whole amount of baggage which tries to tell a woman what is desirable for her, beginning with her clothes. Okay? Attitudinally, you know, this, if you wear these clothes, you're a good woman. If you behave like this, you're a good woman. If you sacrifice your all, you know, for your husband, your in-laws, your parents, your children, the list is unending. Um, your grandchildren are after that. I mean, if you go babysitting in San Francisco, you're, you know, you're practically mother in law <laughs> But my point is, it's a never-ending list of how much sacrifice you can make. The fact you need to choose, and it's something I remember when my, uh, when I, you know, I was bringing up my children alone. Someone said, "Oh, you know, your young wife, it's a big sacrifice." I said, "No, I. If you don't want to do something, don't do it." You know, I think the woman, women today have to just if you're doing something because you love it i mean some women love parenting some people don't and there's no judgment here but if you are doing something as sacrifice barring giving up chocolates i would suggest that there is no sacrifice that's serious here. not even chocolate. may, 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 I, may, I, may <laughs> I add to that uh, you know the the uh, clearing the field so that men can do exactly what they want is what a lot of this is about yeah, yeah. So we are either made into these amazing sacrificing women or into these sluts. Now tell me something, all the men who say sati pana to itna behtareen tha, sabko sati banna hi chahiye, kitni amazing ye aurat thi. If it was such a great idea, men would have become satis. Absolutely. Yeah. The fact that no man wants to be a sati is proof that it is an absolute Nonsense also patriarchal uh, <laughs> uh, construct. Absolutely. But you know, I think sacrifice, the word, it stinks. It stinks. I agree. It really stinks because Look. you think you have done a great thing yourself and expect a lot of gratitude, looking up. It's a terrible thing. Absolutely. And Chandra, I don't know if you are a grandmother, but if I had a daughter in San Francisco and wanted me to look after a granddaughter, grandchild, I jump and do it, not as a sacrifice, yes. I adore yes. my grandchildren. Exactly. I adore exactly. them. So you the see. same act for one would be a sacrifice for another, it would be a joy. And please move towards joyousness. Yeah, not absolutely. Not sacrifice. No, I, I also it's have to say, yeah, I also have to say that had I given up everything else that I do while I was mothering, when the children were very, I would have been a horrible mother because I have, would have been so unhappy not doing all the things. And I've tried to explain to the children, I would take them with me very, wherever I went. But they understood right from the beginning that I was the kind of person for whom motherhood was important, but not all encompassing. And that I had many other things that gave me great energy that I loved doing. And I wanted them to participate in this rather than me to sacrifice all of that for them. Absolutely. There is that sure. difference. Sure. And, and if, I, I wanted, I if I wanted children, it was because I wanted them to be with me, not because I wanted them to be brought up by some ayah or some uh, uh, nanny oh, or yes. whatever. Uh -huh. And I was going to bring them up on my terms. So I took them everywhere with me and I looked for schools that would allow me to take them. You know, I, I have a, if I can just, I'm interrupting, I know I am, but you know, there, I was, always ask this question in my career, okay, how do you bring a uh, home work, work life balance or home life balance? Or how do you match up? 
And I had to tell them, listen, I, there is no such thing. I wake up every morning and if there is a cabinet meeting, then our work takes precedence that day. If exactly. my child is a PTA meeting, exactly. I said, you can't have a one size fits all plan for 18 or 19 years of your life. It's just ridiculous. And, uh, you know, I love parenting. I, I think that like uh, Malika, I parented because I love children and I, the con and I enjoyed it. But if somebody doesn't want to, then don't do it because you want to sacrifice something for the joy of your husband, your whoever it is. You don't want to tell your husband, tell the man who's, or the ma whoever it is that, look, I, I'm not fond of children. It's okay. And come to some agreement or, you know, or do it because, or if you're going to make that sacrifice, then do it because you love that person enough to do it, in which case it's not a sacrifice. Exactly. Never do it because you are sacrificing and you want some peer, somebody to notice it without you ever mentioning it. You know, this, it's a, it's a self uh, deluding kind of illness. And I, I have young people saying this to their parents. You know, when parents say, we've sacrificed our whole life for you. Hello, the child didn't ask to be born. You wanted somebody to take over. It was your decision. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, so I think uh, there's just maybe one last question, and that is specifically to Malika. And it is, does art have to be provocative to inspire social change, social dialogue? Yes, yes, but it doesn't have to be in your face aggressive because, and it does have to be good art. I think that's the first thing that I need to keep bums on the seat for my audiences. If they leave in the first minute, then I'm not getting anywhere. But I think art, you know, today, anybody who says I am not political is lying because from what you wear to what you eat to where you shop, to whether you have a petrol car or a diesel car or an electric car are all political decisions. So for me to go on singing the Gita Govind and say Krishna, yes, I sing to Krishna, but I ask Krishna why same sex love is not, not good enough in a, in a world that is filled with hatred. How can some love be okay and some love not be okay? It's still Krishna, I'm still having my conversation. But yes, it does have to be provocative. It does have to make people think. Uh, we don't live in a world where beauty for the sake of beauty is relevant. Of course it has to be, but it's even the most beautiful things need to make you think because we have become a non-thinking shepherd, sheep. And art has the greatest possibility of enlivening you and making you think. Thank you. Thank you. That is really great. Yeah. Before we close today's session, I have uh, just one thing to ask all of you. So, je ne sais quoi. I really don't know what. Who would like to begin answering that question? Chandra, would you like to begin? Um, Malika would be able to also give us a full answer to uh, the translation of it because she's been there in France for so many years. Chandra, we'd like to hear you begin, please. Um, uh, je ne sais quoi is well I don't know what that's okay, right let me, finish, let me finish the sentence I don't know what number one I don't know what I'm going to be tomorrow as a, what, what could be the new development in me I don't know what the future holds for me I don't know what is going to give me happiness and I, but I do know that I will try to find out. And in that, in that curiosity and in that search for knowing, trying to find out, I think I'll try to be happy. And I think- Thank you. I, please carry on, continue with Chandra. No, no, go ahead. I know. Yeah, I don't also know what the future holds for me, but what helps me is a sense of humor which is laughing at myself and not take myself very seriously. And I love dancing and I'll never be like Malika, I know, but just freely dancing on my own. And it helps my mind and body to fear. Anu, we have to have a session like that together because I also, when I want to de-stress, just put on my favorite music and yeah. dance. 
you know, I think but Malika, I, with I the age, that's becoming a little the body aches. It I won't. It won't. You just it dance does, with me. Does. You just dance with the me. The shoulder, the shoulder is hurting. The neck is hurting. <laughs> but I still do it with my hands or something. <laughs> so, Love Malika, we close with I you. Please. I don't know what democratic freedoms I'm going to be losing tomorrow morning in the world in which we live in. I'm sorry to end on that note, but that's true. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks, Piyush, for coordinating, Vishal. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. It was... Uh, so absolutely... there are some takeaways. Yes, we'll put up uh, some final takeaways. Uh, yes. Chandra and Anu, great catching up with both of you again. Actually, that's, I mean, it is lovely. Lovely, uh, Malika. We still have this uh, come yes. up, so there are some takeaways. So maybe it's going to be of use to everyone, yeah. Just a few points to keep in mind. I think Hold we're going on. too fast. Too Can fast. we go, go back, back, please? Go back to Go back. Please. Go back, please. You should be able to read it yourself and then you move ahead. Now we can move ahead, please. Please move ahead. These are some points that Chandra mentioned during the talk here. Yeah. Right, so we'd like to thank you all. Thank you so much. It was good speaking with all of you. Thank you to all the viewers. I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anu, Malika, Chandra. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Mal